Good evening and welcome to the GovHack Digital Conference for 2024. I'm Chris Vella, the Regional Operations Lead for GovHack, and I'm excited for today's presentation, The Digital Atlas, Unlocking Mapping Potential. I'd like to start off by giving my thanks and acknowledgement to our sponsors who make it possible for GovHack to function. Our friends at Infosys are the corporate international sponsor for this year and have supported GovHack for many years. Um, and the Australian Government, Geoscience Australia, are also a close working sponsor in particular for this event. I encourage you to engage with this session by using the Q&A feature to ask any questions. We have reserved time at the end of the presentation to answer these questions, so don't worry if we don't get to them immediately. Without further ado, I'm honoured to welcome Katrina Illingworth of Geoscience Australia. I'll now hand over for introductions and the presentation. Hello, it's lovely to be here. I'm just going to share my screen. So, hopefully that will all be working. Wonderful. So it is incredible to be here. Hello, my name is Katrina Illingworth. I'm so, so excited to be here to introduce you to the wonderful world, of the Digital Atlas of Australia. I'm an engagement officer here with the team, which means I do a wide range of things. Pretty much I go from department to department, figuring out how we can help uplift data and capability across government. But to begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting today on Indigenous country. I'm here in Canberra on Ngunnawal and Ngambri land, but there may be some of you dialing in from elsewhere in Australia. So I'd like to pay my respects to the peoples, cultures and elders of country across Australia. And I extend this to all Indigenous Australians present today. I'd like to acknowledge a tens of thousands of years legacy of mapping, research and knowledge holding that continues to this day. There is an understanding common to many Indigenous knowledge systems in Australia that information should only be understood within its context, that knowledge cannot be fully removed from its physical environment. These are the concepts that underpin spatial data. So I'd like to recognize the important understanding of the connection between land, waters, community, and time, and to pay my respects to the knowledge holders past and present who have safeguarded that, this wisdom. So welcome to the Digital Atlas of Australia. I'd like to start with a quick video to give you the overview. Just give me one second. I just want to double check my sound will be working. Wonderful. To build a brighter future for Australia, we need access to data that's timely, reliable and relevant to make better informed decisions. But with the increasing amount of data available, finding and using it can be challenging as it often sits in disconnected silos. This is changing with the Digital Atlas of Australia, an interactive, secure and easy to use online platform that brings together, curates and connects trusted national data sets. Powered by a digital ecosystem, it seamlessly integrates data across borders and systems on Australia's geography, people, economy and the environment using location as the connecting thread. Explore data by theme, like transport, geology and soils, land use and more. Analyse data on demand using interactive maps and tools. And visualise data, pinpoint areas of interest, upload data and share information and insights at the click of a button. From optimising planning and investment using infrastructure and population data, to identifying business opportunities with the latest industry and workforce data and revolutionising agricultural practices, analysing data on soil and geology, water bodies and land use. The Digital Atlas is unlocking the power of smarter, place-based decisions. Explore the Digital Atlas of Australia today at digital.atlas.gov.au. As you can see, our goal is to uplift spatial data and capability across government and Australia. We do this through our three unique environments, tailored to meet the needs of different users. So first of all, we have our source environment, which is where government agencies can test out data pipelines and new functionality before publishing them to other environments. It allows us to experiment without affecting any of our day-to-day -day functionality. Um, next is the Digital Atlas for Government, which is a secure environment for authenticated government 
users to explore and analyze data and access a full suite of professional quality GIS tools. Digital Atlas for Government acts as a collaboration space, allowing users to share, create and share apps and maps across agencies. Today, however, we'll mostly be focusing on the public facing digital atlas. The public atlas allows anyone, government, business, academia, communities, to access location data from a range of trusted sources in a central location. It also provides pre-configured applications to investigate data and tools for creating your own maps. Importantly, all environments are designed by non-technical users with the information and tools they need so that they can use the data and create their own maps easily. As you can see from this snapshot, we have a range of trusted data connected into the digital app into the digital atlas. You may be familiar with the themes that we use that are aligned with international standards set by the UN and cover the 14 areas used to underpin decision making. This data comes from authoritative sources and includes things like population and economy data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics, ge geology, elevation and coastlines data from Geoscience Australia, near real-time bushfire boundaries from the National Bushfire Intelligence Capability, water catchment data from the Bureau of Meteorology. It even has the National Archive of Historical Aerial Photography. We're also acquiring high quality trusted national data sets that have not previously been available to the public. For example, the National Roads data set, which was only available as a commercial product through Geoscape Australia. It's now available for free with the CC BY license through the Digital Atlas. It is a regularly updated data set of all of our roads, including things like road names, operational status, and surface types. I know some of you may be thinking 173. It's not a huge number of data sets. And you'd be right. What makes Digital Atlas different is, that, is its curation. We could have simply scraped endpoints from various government sources, but instead we've gone direct to the data custodian, working with them to provide high quality data that is analysis ready. This is complete with metadata, use recommendations, the underlying governance that controls all this, and making sure it's available in multiple formats. The goal is for us to sort out the data so you can get straight on to using it. Of course, none of this would be possible without our partners in this digital ecosystem. The digital Atlas is underpinned by an integrated geospatial infrastructure facilitating seamless data connection across borders, sectors, and disciplines. We're not attempting to be a single tool to replace all tools. Instead, our goal is to connect silos, aiming for the seamless sharing of data directly from a range of existing systems and portals. Right now, we have half a dozen platforms connected directly into the Digital Atlas, with more all the time. Digital infrastructure, it's digital infrastructure, to connect information you can trust with the people making the decisions. Now, we're able to do this because we've taken a technology agnostic approach. This means our, we work to maximize interoperability and accessibility across diverse platforms, ensuring it can adapt to emerging, te emerging technologies without being constrained by specific systems. Our core is commercial off-the-shelf software. This means that the Digital Atlas can integrate with a wide range of technologies. It allows for higher functions like facilitating enterprise integrations, developer APIs, open data, interoperability, and adherence to standards and specifications. Essentially, it's designed to work no matter what system you have, which gives us less limitations, and more possibilities. But you're here with a gov hack. You probably want to know how to use our system. So first of all, if you're looking for some data, you can check out our catalog. Here you can filter by location, type, tags, categories, whatever kind of thing you're looking for. Or if you're like me, you can go straight to the search bar and type in some keywords. This will give you a collection of relevant data that you can scroll through and figure out exactly which one you want. Once you've found a data set that you'd like to look at, you can explore it on the map or have a look through the details. This will give you a look at the kinds of information captured in the data attributes. You can also check out the full details that we work hard to populate with as much information as humanly possible. You can also use the buttons to go directly to making a map, viewing API options, seeing original data sources, or open it, opening it directly in your own system. 
This is definitely a system set up by data nerds. So we've made sure that no matter what your preferred format to work with, you can download it. Whether you're more comfortable with Excel spreadsheets or file geodatabases, we've got you covered. Now, when you're working on your GovHack solutions, you may want to bring the data from the digital atlas into your own systems. There's a couple of ways of doing this. First of all, you can download it. As mentioned before, downloads are available in multiple formats. However, as we work with national data sets, some of these can be quite large. So a neat trick is to use one of the filter options to limit the size of the data set. You can filter it to a specific geographic location or selection of data attributes. From there, you can download it or connect to an API and it'll just transfer over the data that you want. An API is an, alternate to, is an alternative to downloading. It connects up a live stream of data. Uh, for example, this is, um, this is connecting one of our APIs into the Victoria Digital Twin. But you could similarly use this to connect our data to Power BI or even generative AI programs. Connecting to generative AI would allow you to explore, gain insights and generate products from, such, from some of our larger data sets in very, very little time. Alternatively, you could use some of our in-house tools, such as for making maps. From the homepage, you simply select create a map from the main navigation. This will open a map builder. We can choose either basic or the advanced. Let's check out basic first. Now we've embedded help and instructions directly into the application to walk users through the different tools which are available. The basic map allows users to add layers and compare data together. So it's really great for getting a general understanding of the area. This example is going to integrate vegetation data sourced from the Department of Climate Change, Energy, the Environment and Water. By zooming in on a specific location, you can explore detailed vegetation information of an area, allowing for a more in-depth view. The main tools are covered by the buttons at the bottom of the window where you can search and add data. By opening the map layers, you can turn on the visibility on and off and the slider function as being shown here is a really great way to see data in comparison with other sources. This example is comparing vegetation data to imagery. Now, if you would like to save your map for future use um, in presentations, reports and other documents, you can, you can save it, including legends and titles. Is pretty cool. Alternatively, let's have a look at the advanced map creator. Using the menu on the left, you can change the base map. I like the light gray canvas. Then we uh, have used the layers function on, again on the left menu to add data from the ABS on dwellings. When the data is added, users can customize how it's, display, how it's displayed using the tools on the right. They can select specific fields to visualize and change the style using pre-configured options. Users can further customize by choosing different colors, sizes, shapes based on your needs or artistic inclination. Effects can also be added to the visualized data to help it stand out more against the base map. Dynamic charts can also be added to the maps, letting users choose different charts to display specific data. This is a really great way to identify outliers. As you can see, as you move the map above, it will the chart will change to capture the data included in that area. You can also select an outline on the chart and it will highlight the corresponding area on the map. The advanced map creator provides the ability to export the map in a number of formats, including PDF and image files. It also allows you to add data from the outside into the digital atlas. But I suppose the next question is what is possible for you to do with all this data? Frankly, the sky's the limit, and we're, we've only just started exploring the possibilities. But here are a few examples of some interactive applications, maybe to get you started. This first one is an application I actually helped co-develop with the Department of Social Services and the Australian Bureau of Statistics. It shows income support payments like JobSeeker, Youth Allowance, and more from the Department of Social Services, alongside relevant population statistics from the ABS. The application allows users to explore potential connections between population demographics and income support payment recipients, which, for example, you can look at employment opportunities in the area with job seeker data or age demographics, the age pension. It allows you to compare suburbs and regions. Now, this is only one of, our, of many of our pre-made applications available in the public atlas. I would highly recommend having a look through them just for ideas or general background information and all the data that underpins them is available for you to play with in the digital atlas. But what if you wanted to have a look at something that we don't have a data set for just yet? Well, 
have a look at this one. This is one of my favorite applications. It was created by the Location Services team at the Department of Industry, Science and Resources for use, in, for use internally by the Australian Space Agency. In this application, they've used their own tracking and impact prediction data for space debris. So it finds locations of space objects that could or have recently survived re-entry. They then combine it with data from the digital atlas to look at things in the region that could be affected. So this includes schools, power stations, or marine parks. The Australian Space Agency can then use this application to assess situational awareness of space debris re-entering the Earth's atmosphere, capture area features to map restricted airspace, and to support the assessment of potential rocket launch sites. I think it really showcases the incredible potential of joining Digital Atlas foundation data with your own to solve problems or predict, or predict impacts of decision making. And the range of uses are incredible. Whether we are showcasing and understanding our natural world, responding to nat national crises, planning long-term infrastructure, or understanding the unique makeup of our communities, the information and tools available on the Digital Atlas can provide insight and decision making across all of these sectors and problems. So, this is just the beginning of our journey. I hope that these resources will be useful for you as you look to completing your challenges and beyond. There are so many wonderful resources for you to explore and we're adding new data, feature, data features and partnerships every day. Now, if you have any feedback, data sets you'd love to see, or features that would make using the Digital Atlas easier for you, please do not hesitate to contact us or put in a feedback form. We really do use them to make improvements and to prioritize data sets. Hopefully this has given you a taste of what you can do with the Digital Atlas. We are so excited to see the incredible things you come up with and your challenges, and to see the potential of connecting the Digital Atlas up with other technologies that you know and have at your fingertips. Thank you so much for your time. I suppose the next thing is if anyone has any questions for me. Thanks for that, Pat. Um, that was actually really interesting. I haven't previously seen the Digital Atlas myself, and that's a lot of really good data. Um, I wish I had that in previous GoPack years because that would have made my life a lot easier. <laughs> it's very exciting. Although uh, we're very, we're relatively new. Uh, yeah. We've only, we only got out of beta in May and we're only launched publicly in beta form last year. So new, exciting capability. Excellent. I'm glad I didn't just miss that. Um, <laughs> no, that's really good. Um, we don't have any questions in the chat yet, but I did have some questions from that. Yeah. Um, so I actually used to work in, in local government and like we, we always had our own GIS solutions for the local area that covered things like utilities and services. Mm -hmm. Do you think Digital Atlas will like integrate, replace or augment these at all? Or is it a, a bit wider than that? Our goal isn't to replace services. Our goal is to be able to connect them up. Um, so we're not quite at the level of local government, but we have been working with various states and territories to start to connect up their system. And there's nothing stopping like local governments from using connecting our system into theirs. Ultimately, our goal, our remit as part of federal government is national data sets and making nationally consistent data sets. So there's quite a few data sets where we don't collect the information but it's collected either at a local government or at a state and territory level. So we work to make those nationally consistent so that they can be compared across the country. So yeah, it's that we're not trying to replace systems, but rather trying to connect them up. Excellent. So from a, like a business or a government standpoint, are they able to contribute data or, or how do they contribute data? Is it possible to, to do that? Currently, our approach for going after data is that we find priority data sets that we know people are needing and that are using, and then we go directly to the data custodian. So the likelihood is we're probably going to go to you, but if you would like to use our data or if you'd like to build up these partnerships, definitely contact us. If you just, yeah, get on, on the website, that is an option. Um, and it's an important feedback, obviously with all those Unfortunately, because we have so many layers of government, it'll probably have to be in a conversation with the states. But it, our goal is to be able to provide foundation data at a national level that can then be reused in, at multiple levels of government and then rather out in business. Excellent. Um, just a general reminder to everybody, you can submit questions and I'll, I'll read those out. Um, and if you did 
join late because we had an issue with that link, the, there will be a recording of the session that goes up on YouTube afterwards. Um, another question from me. So I know we'll probably get a lot of interesting integrations um, with people using their AI and their BI tools over GovHack. Are there rate limits or anything that we should be aware of for things like the API that um, I should probably mention to people? I think it'll depend on what kind of system that you're trying to connect up with. Some are specifically designed for super easy connection with an API. Uh, others may need a little bit of Python coding or a little bit of coding, depending on what language you're using to be able to connect it up. Uh, the other thing I'd probably check is making sure that you've got the data set that you want, because it can be really frustrating to put it in and then realize that you needed the national roads and it's, yeah, you picked up the wrong one. Yep, excellent. Um, we're not we're not going to get blocked because we're all accessing the same API no. at the same time. <laughs> okay, <laughs> just thought I'd check that one because yeah, I could see us hitting the API and there being some security concerns there over the weekend. No, it's uh, very much designed. The public is very much designed for anyone to be able to use. There's no restrictions on it, and all of the data sets are available with the CC BY license. So you're not going to run into any licensing issues. You're not going to accidentally stumble into some legal gray areas it's all safe data that you are more than welcome to use. Awesome. So does that also then apply commercially? So commercial businesses can can access and uh, access this data yeah. like on a, an essentially commercial basis? Absolutely. We already know several like high level businesses that already use it. Um, so as long as it there's so it's with a Creative Commons attribution license. Yeah. So as long as you declare in your whatever kind of bibliography that you would usually do with data um, yep. for your source, as long as you make sure that it, it, you're declaring that it comes from us, feel free to use it however you want. Excellent. Um, and probably more of a question for like future plans with the digital atlas. Are there new features or data sets that you think are coming along or that you can tell us are coming along um, that would be, that you'd like to share, that'd be good? I can, we've got some, more data sets coming from the Department of Social Services. So this is grant data for how federal government money is being used across Australia, which oh, okay. is really cool. Um, yep. And it's a really interesting data set in that it plots out a lot of local community services, which is very exciting. We're also getting um, earth observation data from our friends here at GGA um, from a group called Digital Earth Australia. So this is satellite imagery going back to the 1970s over all of Australia um, on an average of every six days, which is very, very cool. And the potential of being able to do really, really fun analytic analytics with that, it's pretty high. Um, yeah, we've got a couple of other data sets coming, a lot more coming from administrative boundaries and a lot, and a lot, of coming, a lot more coming from the Department of Agriculture, Forestries and Fisheries as well. So a lot more environmental data as well. So there's always things happening. Excellent. That's really good. We do have a question from the audience. Um, you did sort of go over this a bit, but are there any expectations for citing the data that's being used from the digital atlas? Cite it somewhere. Um, however, you would usually cite it. Uh, in when I've done development stuff, I usually have a little um, pop-up thing that you can click with more information on where you've picked up the data sets from and a link there, a copyright of the Australian federal government. If you'd like to do that. Excellent. We're pretty, we're pretty open with cit citation. Do it however you would like, as long as it's there somewhere. You probably don't mind. A little logo in the corner and it's all good. <laughs> a little logo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and probably my last question was like, as you, like as we're making a lot more of this data available, especially things like satellite data every, did you say every six days? Yeah. Um, do you have any sort of like privacy concerns or anything like that that arise from that that you address? This is actually a really interesting question and one that we come across all the time in our governance space. So the satellite imagery is already available. Um, it's already a system. It is already publicly available if you searched up Digital Earth Australia, you could find it. Um, but we have to acknowledge that there may be more privacy concerns as we make this data more publicly and easily accessible. 
how we manage that is we have a essentially a data group that covers all of government. And they sort of set the rules of engagement mm -hmm. and we deal with data and data privacy. So there's a few data sets, for example, that the Australian Bureau of Statistics put up. Um, at, but they set the level of aggregation, which they are comfortable with, isn't going to be a privacy risk. So they have data. I mean, they have data at point level. They could tell you what's happening at each address, but that would be a massive privacy concern. Yeah. So they aggregate it to, currently we have it to SA2 areas. It's usually about suburbs. Um, and they present it in that way to be able to both be able, it's that balancing act, right? Between yeah. the having good usable data and protecting people's privacy. So we tend to work with aggregation as our primary form of doing that. Um, and we then work with any other risks that could be perceived, including privacy, national security, all these kinds of things. Excellent. No, that's, that's good to hear. Um, we do have another another question. Um, do you have any? Do you have any textual data to train a model? Are all of them, or are all of them, structured data in a table? Ooh. So a lot of our data is so the data sets themselves. The way geographic information systems sort of integrate them is usually that tabular data set. Uh, but what's included in those tables? can be, depending on the data set, can be descriptions. So for example, mm -hmm. with our historical aerial photography, their data set, it's a table, but it includes images in the table. It includes blocks of text, all that kind of stuff. The other thing is if you wanted to train a model, you could do it on the item details mm -hmm. for each of the data sets. You could also do it on the metadata, depending on what kind of model that you wanted to train. So yeah yes the tables but they can often include big chunks of text sure. from those tables uh, we have another question you did go over this a bit in the presentation so i don't know if you want to go back to that part I but always there's sorry there's um does the system allow users to export spatial layer such as shapefile or geo database or do we have to extract via api oh my favorite yes absolutely it i think we have eight different formats um i don't think i have a stationary slide for it, but definitely GeoJSON, file geodatabases, we have your basic Excel spreadsheets, CSVs. Um, yeah, again, we're, this is made by data nerds, kind of for data nerds, um, with the idea that whatever system you like using, we wanted to make sure that you weren't having to do any weird conversions with it. So yes, available for download in eight different formats. We then just also have the APIs available. Yeah. yeah, it did look like you covered your bases with the different export options. So well, I, I, I think appreciate all, that. I think we've all done too many projects where we've had like, every single data set has come in a different format and we've had to like, yeah, remove them all. Um, so yeah, look, <laughs> we're trying to make things as easy as humanly possible for everybody. And I think people appreciate that because, yeah, that makes that whole thing much easier. Oh, yeah. Um, I didn't have any more questions from the audience or myself. Was there anything else you wanted to shout out? Anything else you wanted to tell um, GovHack participants and, and attendees? No, not really. Just uh, super excited to see what you guys make, even just to have to hear your thoughts on it. Again, that feedback form do genuinely, any feedback you can give us is so, so helpful. We're always trying to improve it and to have the opportunity to kind of, yeah, have it tested by a whole lot of people who are excited about data and about using data in really interesting creative ways. It's, we're super, super excited to see what you guys make. I suspect you'll get quite a lot of feedback after next weekend. So. Oh, I, I'm so excited. That, that's not a threat. That's a, that's a good time. Um, we did actually have another question come in. Um, do you have any data about human movement or frequency of human physical activity in general? So we don't have much on, like we don't have any travel lines, if you will. Most of our human or population data comes from the Australian Bureau of Statistics, primarily from the census. So yeah. there'll be a little bit there. There are, are good data sets on 
method of transport to work. So things like whether people take cars or walk or bus, all that kind of stuff. And there's a few there on health implications, health risks, which might also be useful. But it tends to be static for a single year rather than, yeah, the sort of big data that you would see from like transport networks. Sure. Yeah, excellent. Um, so that probably comes to the end of our questions. So thank, thanks, Katrina, for your presentation. That was really good. Um, and I look forward to, to playing around with that tonight just to see what, what's up on the Digital Atlas. Um, so that concludes our presentation for tonight. I just wanted to remind everyone to check out the GovHack website and Hackerspace if you're interested in attending any other of our events, like our Connections event. Um, and if you haven't already, I encourage you to register for this year's GovHack competition weekend from the 6th to the 8th of September. Um, but I'm happy to conclude it there. Thank you for your time. Thanks everyone for coming along and have a good night. Thank you so much.